Welcome to the Sunday Healing ALS Community Meetings, okay? This is week 20 of a 26-week course. We have reached our boot camp phase, and we are now in week three of our boot camp, uh, which is really important. One thing that I do have to mention for the record, we are not medical professionals, okay? We're not here giving you medical advice. So what we're doing is basically giving you the experience of other pals who have reversed this disease. And in that process, we're hoping that you can find your journey of healing your ALS on the way to completing your journey. And so you can be a testimony for others that have uh, also with those that have healed ALS, okay? Understand 60% is your mindset only 40% is physical. So make sure your thinking is very important on how you can turn this disease around. Make sure you have fun and stay positive as you're going through this process, okay? This is not a sprint. It is a marathon and it does take time. Okay, we have Kathy Cummins with us today in our boot camp, and it is on how our thoughts can help us physically and how that really makes a difference. When you're scared, your body goes into a different mode. When you're happy, your body's in a different mode. So your thoughts are very important. Okay, so just to let you know, this is what we have at HealingALS.org to support your ALS reversal journey. Currently, we're in the Sunday meetings. We're currently doing boot camp. Um, once you complete all four boot camps, you will be invited to join, uh, you will be allowed to join the Healing ALS WhatsApp group. At the same time, there are three major things to help support you. One is the HealingALS.org website. There is much more than you think there is there. The uh, 2019 Healing ALS conference recordings are also available. And then any Sunday recordings that you want to miss, that you missed or want to rewatch. Um, next year, we're going to do, be doing the uh, advanced boot camp in February, and we um, are going to be adding to our two current pilot masterminds groups, and also in the spring, we'll we be starting a study. So there's a lot of very exciting things going on, and just so we know, you know, this is how you get to the supplemental material. And I also want to do a huge thank you and shout out to our volunteers we would not be able to do this without volunteers, <laughs> okay? So these are a few, I kind of didn't give everybody's full name because of privacy issues, but we appreciate every single person. We have committees on websites, committees on, on, on just like even this boot camp would not have happened without our volunteers. There's just a lot of things going on. Special thanks this week uh, to Julie McDonough, um, and Kathy Cummins, and also Tabitha, and our moderators today are going to be Julie and Marcel. So just, this is a real group effort for PALS, by PALS, and just, just thank you. It's just huge what everyone's doing. So, okay, um, before I introduce Kathy, we're all going to do an exercise right now, and I, if you remember, we did this in June, but we're going to do it again. I want everyone to close your eyes right now, Everyone in the audience, please close your eyes. And I want you to think of the worst memory that you can possibly think of, the very worst one. Okay, think about what's happening in your body right now. Okay, open your eyes. Okay, how'd that feel? <laughs> Probably not too great, okay? Okay, now I want everyone to close your eyes again, and I want you to think of the best memory, best, best memory that you've, you've had, the best one you can think of, just great, great memory, success, great day, great. Okay, now how does your body feel? Okay, so 
Anybody feel a difference? You just raise your hand if you want, feel, feel the difference. Okay, which state is optimal for healing? Think about this. It really, you know, it, it absolutely makes a difference being happy. Uh, the other slide I'm going to do before Scott, uh, before Kathy talks, is a book by called Radical Remission by Kelly Turner. She had a thousand cases of unexplained cancer remissions. In other words, the doctors couldn't figure out why the cancer stopped. Many of these people were terminal; they were supposed to die in two months, and they never did. And so she did, you know, she said there were like 127 possible causes of why they went into remission. But what was really interesting is every single one of the thousand cases, and she interviewed a bunch, others were questionnaires, but look at the green versus the black. So out of the nine things that virtually every single one of the thousand cases did, they had in common, Number one and number four have to do with your physical body. Number two, three, and all the rest, this is all has to do with your thoughts. So that's why this is so important. We're so honored to have Kathy here. She was diagnosed um, in 2005 with uh, primary lateral sclerosis and with ALS in 2008. Um, we met her in 2015, and we have some really nice film of her from 2016 um, that's going in the docu-series. And um, she also spoke at our 2019 uh, conference. And anybody, you gotta remember, she's 15 years into this process, and any of you that know, that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, so we wanted her to share her, you know, her story and, and, and some of the things that she did from the mind approach. She used a lot of holistic and traditional approaches. At her worst, she needed an electric wheelchair, a walker. She needed, she couldn't cut her own food. Uh, she couldn't um, type. She had a voice amplifier. Um, and she's really now doing, as you can see, very well, but she's still in her journey, as I think uh, most of us are. So I'm so honored, uh, Kathy, to welcome you. So. Um, I'm hoping that you're unmuted and here. So Kathy, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, Tish and Scott and the whole team. I know that the uh, healingals.org is an enormous um, team effort. Lots of good things going on there. So uh, the last picture was of uh, Trek in Halloween. I hope you all had a nice Halloween. And um, he he's the one that takes the food, at the, the candy out to the kids, and they just love it. And so he's a real ham, but he's also taught me an awful lot. And uh, as a puppy there on the left-hand side, um, I just love that picture. And he says, take a good long look in the mirror. You know, really important to remember that we have a lot of control over our lives, more than we think, and you just need to tap into that power. And uh, the middle picture, I, I told Trek I was hot. So you need to be careful what you say, because I don't want him to pull the fire alarm. I, I asked him to actually open the door, uh, but I said I was hot. So words have power, right? Surround yourself with, with positive energy. Uh, watch what you say. You know, think that everything that you say is actually going to eventually come true. And um, it will actually make you uh, closer to that, that possibility of healing, being positive. And then once you take the advice of uh, what what uh, Tish and Scott have been saying, you know, in the whole healing ALS, and you're started on your journey, you're looking at your diet, you're looking at your supplements, you're considering detox and all the other things that physically your body needs to um, start to, to change and heal. Just stop and smell the flowers. And just remember that if you're on a realistic healing plan, you just have to be patient and enjoy your life. And I think those are really important to remember. So for me, a big piece of being able to do this for the I think more than 15 years I've been on this healing journey is that it is a journey. It's not really the destination. So I have to be very careful to keep my perspective clean and keep it simple, just one step at a time. And I think it's really important that we, we just outline where to start. We start with education, which is what we're doing now. You got to have patience you need to really explore your inner thoughts and trust your emotions. 
follow your intuition because that's a big piece of healing. Build a really good healing team around you, practitioners and supportive people. Stay optimistic and surround yourself by optimistic people. And then be disciplined, but at the same time, gentle on yourself because this is a long road and you can't get frustrated or mad or angry. Uh, those are not helpful emotions, first of all, but being gentle on yourself is, is the way to take this in the long term, you know, do this for the long, the long haul. I really, um, when I was diagnosed with ALS, I really, I really didn't start improving right away. It actually took me a couple of years and that was hard, you know, um, but as I thought about it, I thought about actually as a, as a, um, I'm a chiropractor and as a chiropractor, I, I deal sometimes with uh, fractures and other things. And I really love to put casts and splints on patients. And, um, you know, if a bone breaks, it takes six weeks, eight weeks for that bone or the sprain, bad sprain strain to, to heal. And so the body takes time to heal. And so I started to think about how long had I been doing the things that I thought may have contributed to my ALS and how long it really took me to get sick. And I probably would guess that it took two to three times as long for me to heal. And I'm still in that process. So you not only need to think about how long your diet's been bad or how long you've been exposed to mercury or how long you've been exposed to, to glyphosates and other toxins, but you also need to think how long maybe in your mind and your heart and your soul that you haven't been really healing and, and being positive and, and being on the path to optimally keep your mind, heart, body, soul, all of that together healing. So I wanted to quickly just uh, address some things that I think Tish will look at in the advanced boot camp, which are the emotional, emotional challenges of ALS. You know, first of all, I'm sure you've all heard of the stages of grieving and there's somewhere between five and 15 different stages of grieving um, and they're normal to go through. And I know that nobody wants to be angry and nobody wants to, to be um, depressed or, you know, feeling like they're in denial and not really knowing whether or not they're dealing with the issues, but you just got to give yourself the space to go through it. And for me, I went through the stages of grieving many times. Uh, first time I had to wear AFOs, I was really bad. I did not like that restriction of having those braces on. And the first time I went in and my breathing numbers dropped significantly and I had to go on a, on an AVAPS, I really was not happy. And I started over those stages of grieving. And um, first time I realized I couldn't go on the vacation that I wanted, you know, and do the kind of uh, swimming and surfing and other things that I wanted to do. So, you know, I, I've been through the stages of grieving a bunch of times and I imagine there's more to come. Um, and sometimes they overlap. Sometimes when I was in two stages of grieving about different, different things. So I would say, look into that and uh, assess where you might be in those stages and, and just give yourself the room to breathe and be there. Second thing I think that was really important that I did, and I think you should, is construct a bucket list and have a bunch of amazing adventures to look forward to. You know, maybe some things you can't imagine doing now, um, you know, until you heal a little bit more but definitely things that you can do now and just enjoy your life. So you really need to think about accepting the diagnosis because you can't, you can't stay in denial forever about the fact that, that we have ALS, but you don't have to accept the prognosis. The doctors don't have to be right about the fact that, that you're only gonna go downhill from here because it doesn't always happen that way. And there's a bunch of us that, that are uh, demonstrating that and, and uh, Tish is exposing you to a lot of us that are on this journey and actually doing well. Then I think the next most important thing is to reinvent yourself. And you have choices, you know, you can reinvent yourself as being bitter and angry about ALS, or you can be new and improved. And uh, we did some really interesting things when it came to the concept of reinventing ourselves. And one of them was that I was a potter. And we took a bunch of my favorite pots and a bunch of my um, things that represented uh, you know, pieces of uh, pottery or art or jewelry or other things that, that um, represented what I was back then. And we had a, kind of a, a purging ceremony and broke them into pieces and just shattered them. And then we took all those old pieces and we rebuilt a new life. And this piece of pottery here is sort of a representation of taking those old things and, and building them into something new and improved and something that's kind of the 2.0 version 
of myself. And I know that you're all in that process. And so think about what it is that you want that, that new 2.0 of you to be and make it the best it can be. And so you need to find positive things to enjoy every day because that's going to help you to head in that right direction. And think about the kind of things that you're saying because words have so much power. I, I just remember personally saying things like, oh God, I'm so sick and tired of this. Or I just don't want to do this anymore. Or I can't take it. You know, those kind of things, uh, you, you, you put them in your cells and they change your cells for the worse, not for the better. So words have power. So watch what you say. And then I think it's also really important to explore what happened around your initial symptoms. For me, oh, I could go on, I could go on for the whole hour about the kind of things that I was going through in 1993 when I first had my symptoms that we thought were MS. And then in 2004, when I first started having symptoms and not being able to walk. And then 2008, when ALS finally just took my breathing down to, you know, uh, incapacitating pretty much. Um, and each one of those events, and, and also other times, I had this big emotional thing that happened that I didn't realize that the point was connected, but they were. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was uh, an Olympic hopeful in judo, and it, I, it was my whole life to become an Olympian, but it was so much pressure. And I don't think that back then I really understood how much pressure I was putting on myself. And in the latter games, which is one of the back doors to the Olympic trials, I broke my arm. I mean, I literally cracked under the pressure. My bone literally cracked under the pressure of it. And to look back on it now, I wish that I would have maybe been a little more in touch with my feelings so that maybe I could have stopped the physical manifestation of what, what was happening in my emotional body and how I, how I express, expressed that by stopping myself, by causing an injury or getting injured. Um, I'm not going to say I caused ALS, but, but uh, I'm going to say that I have the power to change it for the better from now on. And um, then I think it's a really big question that you have to ask yourself. And that is that how does this illness serve you? And if your illness were to go away, what would you be afraid of? And I think that's just one you might need to sit with for a little while. And, and I certainly do and, and did and will again, because it comes up over and over that how being ill might serve you, you know, like, uh, I'll give uh, an example, maybe being sick, you get attention that you didn't get before, or maybe you got out of um, working at a job that you really hated anyway, or maybe there was a relationship that you just wanted to, to get be free from, you know. Um, so anyhow, go back and think, ask yourself, you know, how is this serving me? And how can I change that? And then I think if you face your death, that you have, um, you'll have a much more uh, fully positive life. And so again, that this, all this stuff will probably be addressed in the advanced boot camp for the emotional and mental piece. All right, Tish, next. Um, I had a great team of doctors. Being a chiropractor, almost all my friends are physicians. So it was really, it was really um, easy for me to get the best medical doctors and naturopaths and acupuncturists and counselors and uh, gosh, I, I just had so many people giving me advice and helping me out that I, I had a great, uh, a great number of things to choose from. So I got to sort of look at each one, see if it resonated with me, trusted my instincts, both about the practitioner and what their perspective was, and also about the treatment. And so I got to do a lot of things that were really important. Um, I'm going to go up to the top bullet there because I missed that one. And I think that you need to go to the ALS clinic and your doctors with realistic expectations. I don't think that I would be in as good a shape as I am right now if it weren't for my doctors because they got me an AVAPS. They got me a Chatovox, which helped me to be able to, to speak when I couldn't really get the volume to be able to communicate. And I might have just kind of curled up in a ball if I couldn't, you know, talk to my family and friends. And they got me a wheelchair so that I could rest and go places and still live and do things. So the medical world and what they can do for you can be amazingly crucial. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't want to discount that. But the practitioners that really did the best for me were the ones that looked at what caused my illness and um, really got down to all the things that have been talked about in the past couple of boot camp sessions, like the toxins and diet and you know the things that I might be missing, like vitamins from my from my uh, lifestyle. So anyhow, search for the cause of your ALS. 
And don't be afraid to change doctors and search out other fresh options if it's necessary. There's no reason why you have to stick with a doctor if they're not resonating with you and or if they're getting negative on you and you just need more positive influence from your, your guides. Uh, and make sure that you include counselors, spiritual leaders, you know, whoever you need on your team. And I think next week for boot camp is when you're going to talk about how to build your team and how to find those ideal practitioners for you. So I wanted to do a little exercise with you. And before Tish switches the slide, I want you to just think about finishing this phrase, I am. And in your head, think, I am. And what's the first word that comes to your head? And Tish, go ahead and switch the slide. Okay. You want to put it in the chat? Everybody want to put that in the chat real quick? We don't have to respond, but throw it in the chat. Just, just switch the slide. So I hope these are the things that actually popped into your head, right? I hope I am healing. I'm releasing. I'm forgiving. I'm adapting. I'm strong and I'm brave. I'm resilient. I'm in control. I'm grateful. I'm worthwhile. I'm learning. I'm vital, you know? Um, I, maybe I'm living. And, you know, I, I've, I've got a few steps to go before I can actually jump to say I'm healing. I'm fighting. Yeah, you're fighting, right. And that is strong and that's brave and that's resilient and that's trusting and that's adapting and that's being in control. Yeah, I'm happy. Excellent. I love it, right? So all of us, now I'm going to say, I'm going to speak for me. I have bad days, right? Sometimes I have a hard time coming up with a positive word with the I am. And I need to go sit in a room by myself and I need to regroup and I need to do some of the things we're going to talk about, like praying or meditating or using some other kind of uh, thing to change my, my perspective. And sometimes it's petting my pup and sometimes it's listening to music and sometimes it's going out to dinner with my, my, my spouse or seeing my grandson. I mean, you got to find the things that help you come up with the I am healing perspective. And yes, I just saw something flash across there. Caregiver, uh, we love our caregivers. Yes, I am in absolute gratitude for my caregivers, for sure. Okay, Tish, next. So when we start getting into those, those thoughts maybe that, maybe that weren't quite as positive, the I am healing, um, we need to think about how we are reacting to what's happening. And there's, you have choices, right? When somebody somebody says something or something happens, you have a choice of how you react to it. And you have a choice to be intentional about what happens in your body, what happens in your mind, what happens in your world. And that's part of what you're doing when you're working with this positive attitude, right? Intentional living, taking what's happening and being very intentional about how you perceive it and what kind of action steps you make from there. And so we're gonna visualize, we're gonna do things like use drawings or journals and look at what the ideal future might be like for you. For me, we have uh, this big white right on wipe off board, you know, we use the dry erase markers. And every few weeks, months, whatever it is, definitely always, we do a giant one on the, the new year. Um, we draw, I mean, sometimes they don't even make sense, but we draw the the future, we draw the beauty of the future and all of the things that we're going to have and, and be. and. Uh, like the winning lottery is always on there. I haven't gotten that one yet, but we're going to keep working on that. Um, but the ideal future, you know, I'm going to go, we're going to go back to Maui and I'm going to swim two miles out to go play with those turtles that, that, that I, I did, you know, a bunch of years ago. Just the positive things that you just see yourself being and doing in the future. And we want to stay present, right? We want to meditate, pray, use positive affirmations, um, release all those negative thoughts, you know, to be grateful for what you have, focus on the things you can do, not what you can't do, um, because eventually those things that you can't do will become things you can do as long as you're staying positive and focusing on things you can do. Surround yourself with things and people that you love. That's so important. And then give back, share, spread your love and wisdom, kind of the, the you know, lemonade from lemons kind of idea. Fish. Your turn. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think Kathy covered most of this already. Just make a decision. It's a decision to be positive 99% of the time, and then you figure out a way to do it. Um, visualize absolutely what is your ideal life after healing. You know, when you, when you, if you were to be totally healed today, what is your perfect life? If you hated your job, 
before you got sick. Don't visualize going back to that same job. Figure out what your ideal job is. How do you ideally want to spend your life? So anything is possible. And um, when you do positive affirmations, you do them with emotion. Uh, forgiveness is absolutely crucial. No judgment, no forgive everybody for anything. Because the minute you hold on to anything, it will eat up at you. You've just got to be completely non-judgmental, you know, for, for everything. Um, and I think we've already talked about that. Find ways to give back, stay in the present. Um, I found, so listen, a lot of people have found you listen to a positive, uplifting YouTube video. Listen to... Uh, like I like, like, you know, like Greg Brayton, either a lecture, a really positive lecture or a really positive feel good movie, music. Um, Gabo Mate talks about not stuffing your emotions, release them. It doesn't mean you need to shout and scream at your, at your, um, at your significant other. What it means is you need to figure out, oh me, boy, I'm feeling this, acknowledge that you're feeling it, release it and let it go versus stuffing it because energetically every stuffed emotion gets stored in your body. Um, positive mental attitude. How can I turn this negative thing that just happened to me into something positive? And there's always a lesson. And wow, I learned that. I learned that. So it's never, there are no negative things because you're always learning from everything that happens to you in negative and make sure live in joy, have fun, always look at positive things. Um, and these are some of the books that we suggested. Um, you know, you, and, and these will be listed on the on the, um, the blog. I wrote a blog, it's dated October 30th. I'll change it and add these to November um, 1st. So um, these are just some things that you can do. And overcoming fear, there are four major fears that people with ALS have and, and how you get over it, but basically, um, a lot of people have found huge um, results. If you watch enough near-death experience videos, it might take 20, it might take 100, but very few people do not completely lose their fear of death at this point. So just watch them because it will change your life. <laughs> um, and so uh, these are two of the most famous ones, but there are hundreds of them. And also remember that any, any one of us could get hit by a truck. We could get terminal cancer. We could have a stroke or a heart attack tomorrow. Any of us could die tomorrow, today. So, and also look at, as Kathy gave me this one, opportunity, this is an opportunity to get your affairs in order. Look at this as an opportunity. I'm gonna get my will done. I'm gonna get all this financial stuff taken care of. And guess what? Once you heal, it'll already be taken care of. <laughs> You don't have to worry about it. It'll be great. Um, so to get over fear of disability, uh, pals have told us, think about what's the worst that can happen. Um, you go into that and you face the worst and you realize that the worst is possible. Mark Manchester is, you know, he faced the worst. He could not move even one finger. So just because you go there, and you do get disabled, think about all the things you can learn from being disabled. And then when you heal, it's, you know, it, it's even better. So, and like, we all have friends with, with six children, anybody can get a car accident and, and definitely um, have a plan in place. This is what I'm going to do. And so, um, so being, you know, how are we going to you know, figure out care? It doesn't matter. But the, the, the other two fears that we noticed is just, um, and this is also, Kathy, these are your notes. <laughs> you know, fear, fear of being dependent because a lot of people with ALS are control freaks. And it's like, you've got to learn how to ask for help, how to let, you know, other people take care of you, not necessarily being in charge. And even the fear of poverty go into that face it, what's the worst that can happen? And you realize, look, this isn't the end of the world. You know, you, you can overcome that as well. So um, it's all yours, Kathy. All right. So uh, we're going to look into some of the ways that we can use what I think are sort of the laws of the universe 
um, and one of them is called the law of attraction. Be the energy that you want to attract, right? That the universal flow goes where the attention is. So if you think about fear, you're going to manifest things that are your fears. Um, so if we can manifest and we're that powerful, think about healing and, and believe that you can heal. And I would love it right now if every one of you said out loud, I believe I can heal. You got to say that again because I didn't hear you that time. Do it again. I believe. Everybody's I believe muted. I can heal. <laughs> right? Just tell for me. Say it for me because I can hear you. I, I believe, believe I can, I can heal. heal. That's right. Everybody else is muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, I know that. I know that. But, but to, be, to be totally honest with you guys, I still get chills when I say that right? I believe I can heal because it's not always easy every day to believe it, right? But I know I can, I know I will, and I know you can and you will too. That's right. Uh, I will surely heal. I love that. I love that. So are you ready to create health? And so how do you do that? You do it one step at a time. You got to believe that it's possible, believe that you can heal, and then you got to be ready to, to do that one step at a time. There's some really interesting science that's out there and you know a long time ago in my spiritual practices we used to talk about thoughts changing our chemistry now we actually have evidence i mean there is there's good science on a concept called neuroplasticity that's the ability of the brain to form and reorganize those synaptic connections those brain connections in response to learning or experiences particularly following an injury and what that really means is that your body is incredibly resilient and it can make new connections. It can take a nerve or a cell or um, uh, a piece of tissue, there's all kinds of tissues, and change its purpose. And sometimes even it can expand its purpose, purpose and it can do two things at once. It can do its usual function and then also sort of reorganize the way it's working and also do some additional functions so that you can heal, so that you can grow and change and heal. And they're, used, they're talking about neuroplasticity from, for everyone, like, you know, stroke victims and dyslexics. I mean, it's, it's amazing stuff. Um, next slide, Tish. This to me was really uh, fascinating. This was from um, uh, Restorative Neurology and Neuroscience. And it's talking about using meditation practices and how that neuro, concept of neuroplasticity, right, uh, it happens for at a higher level and for a longer period of time with meditation. And it changes and improves your cellular health. It, it reduces the rate of aging within cells and it changes the rate of decay in your gray matter, which is part of your brain, right? I mean, crazy. This is just from a couple of years ago that they're actually doing these, these studies that are proving that we have the ability to change our body for a positive way. And for me, I thought I would share for a second uh, a little bit about how I meditate. And this, this big picture here is my meditation space and a lot of pillows. Uh, gotta be careful about how many pillows I have because I will fall asleep sometimes. Um, so sometimes I sit up on that little blue thing and the little song bowl next to there. To, sometimes I use music to get me, get me started. And you can't really see very closely, but those two little tables have, uh, just things that are important to me. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit into ritual. I'm a little bit into objects. You know, one of them, my aunt passed away and, you know, she gave me one of those things. And one of them, one of our pups that passed away. I believe that there are um, all kinds of ways that I can be helped on this journey. And so that's, that's some stuff that's personal to me. But um, anyhow, so there's my meditation space. Let me go, I want to go back for a second. And I want to tell you about one of my very first uh, crazy no, not back slide tissue. Yeah, I want, I want to go back in history and I want to share with you. Uh, so I've been a martial artist since I was about five years old. And I've had the, the, uh, the amazing fortune to be able to, to study with some, some crazy, crazy uh, great leaders. And a lot of times in the martial arts, a meditation is part of what we do. And I know that you guys probably can't read that x-ray that's there, but that's my elbow. And if I had a pointer, I would point to the tip of my elbow, which is completely in the wrong place. It should be a few inches in the other direction. And what happened was I broke my arm and my, the point of my elbow, kind of where you hit your funny bone, went up and almost into my armpit. 
and my arm was facing backwards and my palm was on my back, right? So uh, that hurt. And as a matter of fact, I passed out several times and on the way to the ambulance, in the ambulance, in the hospital. When I got to the hospital, I was uh, in line number, I don't know, 20 or something. And there were three or four people that were actively having heart attacks in front of me. So I ended up in the hospital bed with my arm broken in a couple of places and my elbow in the wrong spot for about three and a half hours. And um, the only thing that I could do, they weren't giving me any pain meds. They, I'd torn the nerve in the artery and they were planning on, they were not planning on, they were discussing uh, with the doctors and with my coaches actually amputating my arm. And so uh, I had to do something to get out of the pain and calm down because my blood pressure was going crazy and I was going into shock. And so I, my, my uh, coach said, meditate. And I worked on what I knew of meditation at that point. You know, this is, uh, I don't know, 40 years ago, maybe not that, maybe 35 years ago. And um, I could actually in that hospital bed with my arm in a distorted position, be completely free of pain, completely free of pain. And in a calm state, my blood pressure would come down and I could be there and I could stay there until a nurse came by to, of course, you know, poke at me and ask me how I was okay and kind of jarred me out of that meditative state. But to me, this was the beginning of me knowing I can do anything. I, I felt after being able to control that, that level of pain in that situation, I felt like I can do anything, you know? And I don't know if you guys have something like that that you can draw from, some sort of experience that you've had where you actually, you actually, you know, demonstrated the power that you have, but draw on that and, and go back and, and well, I walked, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah, so you guys, you guys have stories. I know you do and you're powerful people and I know that you can do things like that. So anyhow, I meditate now because it helps me sleep better. I breathe better. Um, and I, it's absolutely part of my healing journey. So for me, um, I don't know how much of my meditation practice you want me to talk about, but I, I kind of use uh, what I see behind my eyes. And I know this is going to be, I'll give you more specific directions in, in a slide, but I'm going to share my personal experience. When I meditate, and I can meditate anywhere, I don't have to be sitting in a particular place with a particular song or particular lights, close my eyes and behind my eyes is sort of like a lava lamp, right? So I close my eyes and I see, I see a lava lamp. I see colors moving, flashing, you know, and I work on that lava lamp to control it, to bring it in and get everything organized. I organize the lava lamp behind my eyes and it comes to the center and it raises a bit and it goes about to where you could imagine your third eye. And there are some times where I'm just, too distracted, too anxious, too much in pain, and I can't quite get there. So I might tap on the spot where my third eye is a little, that's up kind of between your eyes and above your nose. And I might just think about the feeling of being touched there and start to organize my, my lava lamp of thoughts, you know, and into that spot and start to get into that space. Um, so, However you get to meditation, I think that it's an incredible skill if that's something that, that you seem to resonate with and might be on, uh, helpful on your path. And I also wanna share something that my, uh, my teacher, my, my martial arts teacher shared with me years ago, Kwan Tse Hung. He said in, he said in his, his Chinese English, he basically said, it's easy to meditate on a flickering candle. Not so easy to meditate when my fist is flying at your face. <laughs> and that's kind of where we are right now. We're at that place where there's stuff flying at us and it's scary and it's hard. And so don't expect that meditation will just always be easy all the time to do. That's the whole point. It's the point to take you to that place where your universe is organized inside your soul. So let's, let's look at the next slide and get into some of the details. Okay. So people talk about quiet in your mind. I honestly believe your mind's never quiet, right? It's always thinking, but you just got to settle down that monkey mind. I'm sure you've heard that term monkey mind where you're just thinking all these thoughts and you can't control them and you're just bouncing from thing to thing. All you want to do is just settle that down, right? And if those little monkey mind thoughts or you go off on tangents while you're sitting there trying to get focused and quiet, just acknowledge them with compassion 
then just come back to your little lava lamp, you know, or whatever it is. Maybe, um, maybe you have some other kind of way. I'm just going to use a lava lamp for just a second. Just acknowledge it. Yep, yep. I, I don't know how I got off thinking about the space shuttle or chocolate, but I'm back, right? I'm back here. And try to stay in the now, right? Just let everything go. And whatever comes in, experience it. Say, yeah, okay. That's, I, you don't need to stay here. You're going on. We spend way too much time looking at the future or you know, focusing on the past. We're just trying to stay just in this present moment. And so we're trying to get into sort of this altered state of consciousness and it's nothing magical. I don't think, I don't think meditation is anything magical to be honest, um, it's just a tool. And don't feel like you don't have the right training or you haven't right, watched the right video or you're not doing it right. You're doing it right if you feel calm. You're doing it right if you feel peace. You're doing it right if you get up and you're better afterwards than you were before you started. Um, uh, or sometimes you're better just because you now have some energy to do something about going to the place where you can get better. You know, you may meditate on just, I just don't feel like I can heal today. I'm, I'm in a bad spot and meditate on, okay, I'm not sure I can heal, but now I am ready to at least fight that fight and get myself to that place, right? Um, so that quiet focused mind, you stay in the present and it leads you to a state that's not quite sleeping, but not quite awake. Like you're not, you're not out, right? You see what's going on around you, but you're just kind of not paying attention to it because you're in this, this peaceful place. And your brain activity is actually increased, especially in those places of your brain that happiness and positive emotions, and there's evidence that staying in that meditative space actually makes positive changes in those areas of your brain. So you're doing stuff, even if you're not meditating on anything in particular, and you don't know that you're being productive on the outside after your meditation, you are do some, doing something positive inside your brain, right? When you're meditating. Next slide. Okay, um, this is from Johns Hopkins. They looked at 47 studies, which to me, um, I, when I looked at these studies, they were really well designed and pretty reliable. And they're talking about mindfulness meditation, what we just talked about, and how that it can reduce anxiety, depression, and pain. And I love this. I love this, this is the medical world, but there's no evidence that was more effective than drugs or exercise. Oh, so. If you were to take a bunch of pills, uh, meditation, it's, 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 all, it's almost, as, it's as good. It's not any better than taking a bunch of pills. Like crazy idea coming out of JAMA, the, uh, the uh, American Journal of uh, Medicine. It, it, meditation is incredibly powerful. The fact that they're saying that it is as powerful as some of the medications or equal to some of the medications is, is just amazing. Right. You can look that up. You get the, the links there for that. But that's a good study using functional MRIs and EEGs. Tish? Good. So here is uh, a technique in case you need some more uh, focused direction. So I suggest you get something to focus on, some kind of object, right? Um, a little light. On my meditation space, you can see in the back, I have this little, uh, this beautiful little um, paperweight on a lighted stand so the colors change and they just you can just look at that and just sort of imagine possibilities from it but you could try a light you could try a, a flickering candle you know real or not you could try something with this with a sound like a metronome you know that kind of thing or maybe an instrument maybe you've got some harp music uh, or a mantra some kind of phrase that you want to say over and over, sounds of the environment. Sometimes I like meditating to like the wave, uh, ocean wave sounds. Music, maybe you've got a song that gets you to the right place. I have some of our songs from church that if I cannot get to the place where I just settle down, I sing some of my church songs. That helps me. Um, maybe it's a movement. Maybe for me, actually, I when, I'm, uh, when I don't feel like sitting still, I do Tai Chi or Qigong. And that gets me into the same similar kind of meditation. And of course, this is all about your breathing. So you can just meditate based on paying attention to your own breathing and just work on that. So you need to be comfortable. You know, I don't say you have to sit, but you have to be at least in a comfortable position that when you finally relax, that um, you, um, you know, you're not gonna uh, fall or anything like that. Uh, focus on your breathing. If you find your mind wandering, just gently redirect it. That's fine. Everybody's mind wanders when they're when they're uh, meditating. Get focused back on your breath. Think about think about um, nothing. Think about nothing, or focus on whatever the intention is without actually trying to engage it or fix it. Right? You're not trying to make a commentary or put any pressure or explain it or understand it. 
all you're trying to do is focus on something. Maybe it's something simple like moving a finger. Maybe it's something simple like expanding your breath. Maybe it's something simple like just having the power to be able to um, you know, be positive for the day, whatever it is. Just keep coming back to it. Negative thoughts come in, brush them away, come back. Okay? And focus on the sensations that are happening in your body and acknowledge them. Focus on your emotions you know, and what you're feeling. Them. Acknowledge them and let them go. Set them free and come back. And you'll usually just fade into the background for you. You can also meditate on a question if you have it, you know, uh, to get some clarity on things. Whatever it is for that day, I think that meditation can be super helpful. These are actually on the uh, the latest blog that we put in. I, I, I copied them down there. So that these are just a few resources. If you're not used to meditating, you know, go on YouTube and find what appeals to you. What, you know, what, what helps you. Um, and the Headspace app, some people have found that helpful, Joe Dispenza, but there's a ton of them on there. So I think the main thing is just, you know, look around at what's there, anything that works for you, that's what you need to do. And a uh, prayer for me. Um, I, I don't want to tell anybody what to believe, right? Maybe you have a higher power or you call it infinite spirit or creator or, you know, Yahweh, or Allah, Buddha, Jesus, whatever it is, um, draw from that bigger source. For me, it's incredibly comforting to know that I have a connection with my personal God and that, 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 that God's always with me and working through me. And I believe that every thought I have is a prayer. Every thought is a prayer. And so for me, Prayer has been, I would say, one of the most important pieces in my healing, and so would a lot of the other pals. Um, but if that's not your belief, uh, that doesn't mean you can't heal. That just means that you have to figure out what your own personal spiritual journey is. And we have tried a lot of things. I mean, we have studied different religions. Um, we have gone on uh, shamanistic journeys. I, I actually um, needed some personal guidance so I started taking classes. And if you go back to that last picture for a second, Tish, um, I actually got my ministerial degree because that helped me to take classes and I had to face a lot of things through that uh, process and training. Um, and so to me, that was, that was a constructive way to get to some of the, the you know, spiritual pieces that weren't easy for me to face without a little pressure. Um, so find what, what makes your spiritual journey uh, work and make, do it in a positive way. Just... Okay, so these are just a few people who have healed from prayer. Um, I think there are 10 listed on healingals.org at the bottom of the homepage. There are 10 pals that have healed by prayer. And those, these are the people that literally healed only with prayer. I would say prayer was involved in uh, maybe 75% of our reversals in one way or another, um, maybe 80%. So um, it is extremely powerful. Um, this is an author who passed away just a bit ago, Louise Hayes. Um, she has a few books, books out there you could see at the bottom. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe in her to the point where I wanna say um, that you cause your own disease, right? That's, and she really wasn't saying that either. She was really trying to emphasize, even though it didn't always come across that way to me when I was reading it, that your habitual thoughts can contribute to your illnesses. And she specifically assigned different attributes to different types of illnesses. And for ALS, she thought that possibly, right? Don't put this, I'm not putting this on anybody, right? So, um, but just maybe look at it, see if it resonates. Um, she thought maybe that there was an unwillingness to accept your self-worth or that a denial of success in some way. So if that resonates with you and you're thinking, huh, that, that, I, I could work on that, then here's some affirmations for you. I know I am worthwhile and it's safe for me to succeed and life, love, life loves me. And you could say that to yourself if that's something for you. I think we should all repeat, life loves me. Life loves me. Life loves me. Yes, Patricia. Right. How's that? That's you know, good. I know it's, that was even bishops. I am, I am healed. I am whole in my body and my soul. Again, with emotion. I'm worthwhile. It's safe for me to succeed. Is not going to work. <laughs> ah, life loves me. I am healed. I am whole. Absolutely. All right. Next. Oh, your turn, I think. 
Oh yeah. Oh, this is it. Yeah. I'm ill and I'm old and my body is old. He said, he said it about a hundred times a day and with emotion, really important. Uh, Dr. Joyce uh, has a whole set of recordings and she would play them day and night, 24 seven. And they were a very, very big part of, of her healing. So again, it's what appeals to you. Uh, different people have, have found different things that work for them. And the, the question is, what is going to work for you? So um, these are just a few of uh, um, a few more resources. Biology of belief, molecules of motion. I mean, this is amazing. They look at these guys all talk about the science, um, the science behind how every single thought that you have actually affects every single thing in your body. And when we did that little exercise at the beginning, I mean, wow, when you feel good, you, you know, think good thoughts, great memories doesn't mean you don't ever get down. But if you can, you know, I go for 99%. And boy, if I have a bad 10, 15 minutes, I'm shoot, shoot, I gotta make up for that one. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay to have a good cry when you're frustrated. I mean, have it let the emotions out. And then, okay, now I'm done. I'm finished. And I'm ready to go back again. So um, yeah, but there's science behind it. Uh, Kathy's uh, um, you know, showed a bunch. There's just so much science behind this. Um, Todd was diagnosed in 1988. He um, was young at the time. He was a teenager. He had this little erector set. He has these middle, little tiny guys wrap, wrapping around myelin sheath around the neurons. And uh, he is now in his 50s. He's doing super, super well. And so he just kept visualizing himself. He worked with Jesus because uh, he's a... Uh, um, He's just has had all these passages from the Bible that said, hey, um, you know what, you know what, would, every time, you know, Jesus healed the leper, he imagined himself healing. Uh, Jesus healed the blind man. He imagined himself that he was the blind man and Jesus was healing him. And it's amazing what visualization could do. And this was a big part of his healing. Uh, Joyce Brown, same thing. She used a lot of visualizations along with her affirmations. Joe Dispenza, if you haven't seen his story, there's like a two minute video and a six minute video. Um, the six minute one is in that, in that movie. Um, you guys can remind me of that movie at the end. Um, but his doctor said, there's no way you're going to walk again. And there's no way you can possibly ride a horse again. I mean, look at these x-rays. It's impossible. So when a doctor tells you it's impossible, go look at Joe Dispenza riding horses today because he was told there was no way he could do that. And he would be in a wheelchair the rest of his life unless he did all these surgeries. He didn't do any of the surgeries. Um, and so uh, anyway, the many, many more examples of visualization, use visualization. And I, I'm going to go back to that, that shiitake going. I have... I don't know, some of you might not know what these are, but cassette tapes, we, we actually need a tape player. <laughs> and mine is so worn out, it doesn't even really sound very good anymore. But yeah, I, I mean, that's one of my personal favorites from, from a long time ago. So yeah. Um, so visualization and muscle memory. I, uh, I had a martial arts teacher, um, an amazing man, I, another amazing man. Um, and he told me this. He, we were sitting in, in the dojo in front of a, uh, a uh, heavy bag hanging from the ceiling, you know, and he said, you've got two choices right now. You can get up and punch that bag 1000 times and get your punch perfect. Or you can sit here with me and you can visualize doing it perfectly 1000 times in your mind. And I will guarantee you that when you make that last, that last punch of a thousand or that first punch of a thousand visualizations, they will be identically perfect. And I thought to myself, well, heck, why would I get up and work so hard, right? I'm going to use my mind. I'm going to grow my mind and make it stronger and make it the thing that, that uh, leads my, my adventure here. And um, so I started teaching martial arts classes, and uh, that's a self-defense class that I was teaching. And uh, this is actually part from one of my cable TV series about self-defense. Um, and in those classes, as well as I teach... Um, uh, American Health, uh, EHA, American Heart Association, first aid, right? What do we do when we're trying to 
um, learn CPR or first aid. We visualize what might happen in, a, in an emergency and we plan for it and we figure out what to do. We play through those scenarios in our head so that in the case of an emergency happening, our body, our brain, our mind have already done it. They, they feel like they've done it a million times and you can just jump right in and take care of whatever the situation is. And so I think visualization is absolutely crucial. And I think muscle memory, which is a se separate concept, I know we're on the same slide there, but muscle memory for me was so important. Um, I had five black belts, so I have five black belts. And so I really connected with the way my body moved and I was so frustrated and I had so much trouble um, accepting the fact that I couldn't do the kind of physical things that I want, right? And so would you go to the next slide? So I would go to the, the martial arts school and I would sit on the mat. This is actually, I actually have the one in my garage now, this is a picture of the mats, orange mats on the floor. And um, I just visualize doing all of the things that I, my body used to be able to do. And I just, I just physically visualize them. And then I get up and I do them and I try. Sometimes I'm on my knees, sometimes I'm laying on my back, but I'm going through the motions in my mind and believing that my body can do it. And there were times where that wasn't quite enough for me. So you see that orange uh, harness with the, gray, with the gray leg holes? I actually hooked that up so that it was hanging over my treadmill. And I put the, the mountaineering harness on and made the, the uh, treadmill go. And I just let my legs flop and flop and flop until they were actually doing the motions of walking. And I visualized walking and I visualized running and I visualized doing anything I wanted, dancing, you know, climbing a mountain, whatever it is. And I just use that repetitive motion to remind my body that my brain knows how to still do it. And that all I need to do is just either reconnect those, those, one, those neurons that are working or build some new ones or repurpose some of the ones that, that don't mind sharing. Um, and I did actually a similar thing, the arm, the, the, uh, the clip art of the arm is to remind me, I uh, was in a bad car accident and got uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or uh, complex regional pain syndrome in my, in my arm. And uh, I had to learn how to use the arm again. And I know I went through the same thing years later with ALS learning how to use my hands again um, and my feet again, you know, to feed myself and all that. But this was one of the early ones where we were doing cross training. I moved my right hand so that my left hand would just, like, left hand might see this, you could do this. I don't know, can you guys see me? I only see Tish. Yeah, I can see you. <laughs> can everybody else see me too? Otherwise I'm just sitting here making funny motions. Yes. Okay. So anyhow, we can all this, see you. <laughs> this, this left arm, this left arm didn't work. And I, okay, come on, you can do it. You can do it. And I just pictured this is my right hand moving, but it's actually my left hand that's doing it. Right. And I got to the point where I could do them both, right. Get back to playing the guitar again. Um, so fake it till you make it. Remind those muscles that they know how to do it. They may have forgotten temporarily, but recreate those motions and remind your body that it still has that power. Um, and of course, that's the power of the imagination. And there are some days where, where I just, I get a little down. So for me, I watch MMA, which may sound not very nice, but um, American Ninja Warrior. I love to watch that show. I'd probably be on it. I wish they had an old folks version of American Ninja Warrior. I think I would start training for that. Um, and uh, the Olympics, you know, is inspiration for me. Uh, I even, uh, I love scuba diving. So when I'm on my AVAPs, sometimes I close my eyes and I pretend I'm scuba diving, just the power of imagination, you know. Um, I sing, you know, I, I imagine when my, when I couldn't get out any volume and when I had trouble with my diaphragm and my voice was so quiet, I couldn't even hear me. Um, I would just play the music out loud and I would, pretend like I was just singing at the top of my voice and just remind my brain that I could do it. Uh, and I, I've had, again, coaches and amazing folks get me to this point where I know I can heal ALS. And, and my judo coach said to me, he said, you're just as prepared as any other Olympian. The big difference between winning and losing is that you got to be the one that's already decided that you won. You know, and that's how, uh, that's how we got to live life. That's how we got to do this. All right, Tish. Um, okay, this is a super important concept. This is going to blow your mind. 
So the honest placebo effect, also called open label placebos, there's been a ton of research lately on this, which is just fascinating. And so we all we all know what a placebo is, right? You go into a research trial and one person gets the real drug, the other per drug, the other person gets a sugar pill. Well, the honest placebo effect is something that they've been studying for maybe about 10 years, I wanna say, I mean, sol solidly. Um, it, more, more in the last recent five years, for sure. And that is that they get people in a trial and they say to them, there's a placebo and then there's the drug, right? And I'm telling you, you're taking the drug and I'm telling you, you're taking the placebo. And we're gonna do this study exactly like we would have if we hadn't told you that you're on the placebo. So it's called honest placebo or an open label placebo, meaning that you're on the placebo. You know you're taking a sugar pill. And we're going to do this trial on this drug. And the, the, the people that were on the placebo still got better, right? And they looked at it in cancer. They looked at it in, I mean, they looked at it in a bunch of different things. And we at the university, I've, I've been a professor at the university about 25 years, and we actually pulled out a few of these articles and as a faculty explored the concept of placebo and how important it is in healing. So you don't even need the, the, the real drug. You can actually heal yourself knowing that you're taking the placebo. I mean, that doesn't blow your mind and that doesn't think make you think that there are endless possibilities to being able to do things with your just your mind um, than read some of this stuff because it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy how much power we have. All right, Tish, change the slide. I'm getting too excited. <laughs> okay, so uh, rest and balance. Oh, perfect timing. For that slide because I'm getting tired. Um, so I don't conserve energy very well. Uh, maybe you can see that. Um, so my doctors over and over keep telling me you are a non-rechargeable battery. You, If you wear yourself out, then you can't recharge. So slow down, pick and choose, balance, prioritize. And they've been telling me that for 15 years. And I I'm telling you, but I'm not sure that I really understand that yet. And I had a question mark after balance and Tish made me take it off because, you know, <laughs> she wants me to be positive, but <laughs> I'm not very good at balancing. Um, but I do know that I only get two or three good hours a day right now still. I know I'll have more soon, but right now, if I want to do something like play with my grandson, I have to plan it because I can't also uh, grocery shop and maybe, I don't know, do other things and then also plan on having a, 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 you know, energetic time with my grandson. So I have to know what my limits are and I have to get good sleep and I have to control my stress. And I, I have to know exactly what I, what my limit is, because if I go over, I steal from my energy for healing the next day. And to me, it's really important. I got a package of, of energy and, and I want to make sure that I have enough of that left that's for healing and put all the positive things in there that heal you know, uh, me and play with my grandson is one of them for sure, but play with him for five hours and I'm too tired. Um, uh, so exercise, use motor memory. We talked about that. Qigong, Tai Chi, Lang Gong, breathing, breathing is life. You don't breathe, you die. So breathe, um, and do anything that you can in order to keep breathing and visualize breathing and, uh, uh imagine breathing and, you know, just love breathing. Just, just, Make it part of one of your passions. Um, I have an amazing physical therapist. So I think physical therapy and occupational therapy as a chiropractor, I, I, I never thought I would find a physical therapist that blows my mind, but I have one that's amazing and helps me get to places and strengths that I didn't know I had. Um, do hobbies, keep yourself stimulated and moving. Uh, I think humor and having fun music are really important. And we already mentioned spirituality. Um, and you know me well enough already after this half hour to understand why. I have that yoga uh, thing up. So there are a few other suggestions I have. Um, right, right when I was diagnosed, I went to retreats at Brighton Bush, which is a, um, a natural healing retreat here by, here by us. And uh, I spent weeks, months, sometimes there, just, just trying to be in a place that was all just positive energy and positive healing and organic foods and natural mineral springs and classes on, on uh, Tai Chi, I just, anyhow, uh, all that. Um, also went to retreats with, uh, at Esalon, which is up at Big Sur, with uh, Mariah here, who I became, uh, um, I just, I owe a lot of my healing to her and her her um, journey with ALS. 
uh, she is a good gestalt therapist. And if those of you that know what gestalt is, it's a very intense type of um, counseling, I guess. Uh, but uh, boy, we did some amazing work with her and specifically around ALS. I also did lots of other retreats and classes. Uh, gosh, so many. Um, which one comes to mind? Uh, <laughs> Valentine's Day. My love and I went to a Valentine's Day retreat at Brighton Bush, actually. And the name of the weekend, of set, the three day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the three day seminar was love on Valentine's. And I thought it was going to be perfect. And it ended up that we spent most of the time uh, beating bean bag bags, bean, beating bean bag chairs with tennis rackets. So it was about getting out your anger. <laughs> so it didn't quite turn out like I planned, but I was obviously supposed to be there for some kind of reason. So we processed whatever we had to process. And um, uh, we do Reiki, we do erasures, which is part of uh, an energy release type of healing work. I work with a shaman. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm open to anything. As long as is it as long as it's not dangerous or you know um, negative, um, and uh, Tish, we got we have some more there. What's the next slide? Yeah, I actually wanted to mention Dr. Uh, Dr. Gladys because she's incredible. She was diagnosed before she was even married, yeah. and she got married and had two children after her ALS diagnosis. Uh, she wasn't going to let anything stop her. She did pass away at seventy, but boy. She mm -hmm. lived a very full life um, with ALS. Yeah, and just and that shows that she's just another example of the power of the mind. Absolutely, I mean, and the wisdom also of work, working with her and Ron. Um, yeah, it was, it was just it was just amazing. Anyhow, um, so find people like that to 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 motivate you and inspire you. Um, so I I uh, in our church has this really interesting. Um, concept, I guess, that we talk about, maybe joke about sometimes, maybe cry about sometimes, and it's called the cosmic two by four, which is the universal's way, the universe's way of waking you up, you know, that cosmic two by four comes in and boom, baps you on the back of the head. And um, so for me, I think that ALS was a cosmic two by four, the universe said, slow down. And this is, this is going to hurt to say, learn some balance. <laughs> learn learn to learn to be a little bit more uh you know prioritized and not wear yourself out so much um anyhow uh so i do i was doing so well with my als that my neuro, my uh, neurologist about every three years would run a full battery of images and lab work and all that stuff and um this second to the last time around she did a brain mri and found a tumor and so we approached Gomer. We named the tumor Gomer because I wanted uh, I wanted to be able to encapsulate him with an identity where he was harmless and sweet and just traveling through and just shucks darn just he was just there and gonna just go on and and not be harmful, right? Um, so we identified and and sort of gave him a, a way that we could the way that we could. Um, imagine him. And then we doubled our efforts again. We changed our diet for things that had to do with brain tumors. And we got on supplements and we got practitioners that knew more about brain tumors. I didn't get rid of my ILS folks, but we just added some new people to our plan. And we did silly things like that uh, little green bush there. There was a dead bush that was, I don't know, about as wide as I could reach out in our front lawn. And uh, one day I said to, I said to my partner, I said, that looks like Gomer. Let's get rid of that. And so a couple of days before I was going to have gamma knife surgery, we got out there with shovels and picks and I laid on the cement and I chopped the snot out of this bush. And we just, it took us three hours. I, I thought it would be like a 15 minute thing. And it was going to be a, a ritual that I could grab my, but I was, <laughs> so I used my three hours for the day. Um, and we finally got him out of the ground and we made a ritual of dumping him in the compost bin. And it was a ritual that was satisfying to me to feel like I took some control over Gomer. And um, can you go to the next slide? The, the gamma knife surgery is uh, cobalt radiation. Um, and so the blue light, we focused on that and we had blue lights around and, and our martial arts school set up a, a um, a little altar for us and the crane that you see in the black there uh, was an animal that I identified with to be able to sort of expand and fly and get rid of Gomer. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know if you guys really can identify with this kind of stuff, but there, you got to find things that 
help you on your path to healing. And I don't, I don't know what those might be for you, but for me, whenever, look at even my watch here, right? Let's see if I can get my watch on. I don't know if you can see that. Cobalt light, right? I mean, I'm still healing, Gomer. I get another MRI in a couple of weeks and, you know, I got blue. I'm surrounded by cobalt. I am um, keeping myself bathed in that cobalt light because I know that that radiation treatments, you know, the gamma knife surgery, that they are healing him. And uh, and then it's an emotional journey too, just like the very first slide we talked about, my little two by four, I'm enough. You are enough for yourself and everyone else, right? So this is a big journey. Um, and for me, I think maybe I just needed a little reminder from, from uh, ALS, maybe I was getting a little complacent because I'm doing well and Gomer came around and said, pick it up. Let's, let's, uh, let's get your fight rejuvenated here. Okay, next slide. So what have I learned? ALS took my voice for a while, so I learned to listen. I really type A, so I have, I've learned a lot about releasing control and trusting. Uh, it was terrible. I always wanted to be the helper and be the provider and be the strong one, and I have almost learned that it's okay to ask for help and be vulnerable. Um, I'm trying to be really thoughtful about mon monitoring my stretch, my stress and my reactions to things. Uh, a big one for me was ego. You know, I learned I'm not my trophies and I'm good enough just as I am. Um, still working on prioritizing balance and I have to say no sometimes, uh, which was never easy for me before. Learn to be open and positive and, and be ready to transform, live in gratitude and humility and forgiveness. Forgiveness is great, it's so important. Um, love myself as a work in process and in, in progress. I'm not, I'm not done yet. And I, I visualize, I dream about running. I can't do it, but I dream about it. And I got to still love myself, even though I can't do all the things I want to. And also don't forget to say that I love you and don't forget to tell people that mean something to you. And a lot of, a lot of you that I've met at the conference um, or that I've met in other phone conversations or Zooms or something like that, you know, I mean, you have changed my world. I hope that I can be a piece of changing your world. And, you know, all of us pals, Tish and, and Scott included, we love you guys, you know, and we hope that, that this boot camp is going to be a way for you to be motivated to just... Uh, do whatever you need to do. So not done yet, still have lots of work to do, but with positive thoughts and hard work and dedication to the education about my health, I really do. I, I trust I'm on my way to healing. Can you hear that? I trust. Tish, talk to me. I trust. I trust I'm on my way to healing. <laughs> ah, sorry. Yay, 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 yay. There you go. I think we've covered all this stuff. Uh, Mind Over Medicine, another another book. Uh, Evie McDonald, just remember, Evie, uh, Evie talked about the seven things that she did. I mean, this stuff works. Lisa Rankin is really funny because she she's a functional MD and she had all these health problems. And then she became a functional MD. And then she realized that asking people about their toxic exposure and their vitamins and their physical stuff, she started asking them about their life, um, about their marriage and their relationship and their career and their just, you know, were they on the right path to life? And she realized that actually them fixing their life was actually more important than fixing the physical stuff that the people that um, healed were the ones that were, yeah, they would do all the diet and supplements and everything she told them to do, but they would also really take a look, a very hard look about what they wanted to change in their lives. So this is an opportunity um, to make some changes. And I love what Kathy said. Um, uh, Byron Katie is just another reference. I'll put all these references, um, add them to the add them to the thing but I want to thank Kathy for coming um beautiful Kathy really really nice um and uh next week uh we're going to talk about how you're doing your own research um how you evaluate clinical trials how to get the most bang for your buck uh what to do if you don't have enough funds for supplements um some fundraising ideas so uh we are into the Q&A thank you so much Kathy for all of this it was beautiful um, <laughs> Uh, Kathy, oh. you're fantastic, Kathy. Oh, thank thank you. you for letting us have a look at ourselves through you. Mm. Because your story is incredible. Very and sweet. I'm sure that we can see ourselves through your story. Because 
No, I don't care. It's coming along. Every once in a while, we get hit with that cosmic two by four. Boom. It just yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're ready to go unmute. Marcel, you are now unmuted. And so why don't you go ahead with the first question? Yes, I have a question here first. So, uh, so there are some questions. Uh, uh, well, we will take mostly the questions that are really related to today's uh, meeting and also sometimes some small general questions. For example, here, Debbie asks, how do you access last week's video from the website? So then you can go to healingals.org. If you are a, rem a member, you can see it and uh, you can uh, see. I think that's the hard work that Scott put into that. So uh, and so also can... one thing, Marcel, you can click on Sunday recordings and that'll take you to the past recordings that we had. And I wanna thank Aiden so much for bringing in the notes. We are now caught up on all of the notes. So along with the videos, you can punch in the notes mm -hmm. and you'll get the slides of all of the past talks that we've done. Perfect. Okay, then question from Robert. Is there something like uh, the treadmill exercise that Kathy showed uh, that I could use to innervate my left arm? Oh, Robert, is that what you said? Robert? Yes. Hi Robert. Um, I would say that uh, there's a there's a good amount of research about something that's called uh, cross training, and your your right arm and your left arm are connected, and you can use like a mirror therapy. That's one of the things we used to do with polio patients when in my training uh, back in the the 90s, um, we would have a polio patient uh, have a mirror in the middle and look at the mirror and imagine their left hand even though they were looking at the mirror and have their right hand do things you know and in their brain their left hand was actually learning how to do it because they were watching their left hand do it um and i i honestly believe that the mirror therapy is a great is a, is a great way to start if you can't do that in your head and then once you can actually visualize that you can just close your eyes and you can move your right arm around and imagine that your left arm, your left arm is doing the same thing. Um, and so I, I think the power of the brain actually is, is sufficient enough to retrain those nerves to connect. And um, I, uh, I mean, you don't need to how need you don't need to know how broken I am, Robert. But I damaged the the nerve with that broken arm, right? And I had no feeling on this whole side of my hand and I've got it back. They told me I never would. And cut off this finger and they told me I'd never have feeling and it took 18 years and I've got feeling and my pulse ox is actually better in this finger than it is in this finger. You know, it's crazy what we can do. So use your right arm and somehow figure out to connect that to your left arm and believe that they are equal and strong and um, if, uh, I don't know how long we have for Q&A, uh, Scott, um, uh, maybe tell me how long I have for each question and shut me up if I go too far. Oh, we're gonna go full. We're gonna try to get as many questions as possible on the okay. list. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so um, there is, uh, there's a technique that I use and that I've used with patients over the years, particularly stroke patients. And that is to close your eyes and um, imagine your body like, uh, like for example, Robert, you close, close your eyes and I want you to, keeping your eyes closed, travel down and look at your shoulder, look at your right elbow, look at your left, your right wrist and your right fingers and you got your eyes closed, but you can, you can imagine your right fingers moving, right? Now come back and now go through your neck and over to the other side and now you're, now you're imagining your, your, you're looking at in your head, you're looking at your left shoulder and your left elbow and your left wrist, and you're thinking about moving your left fingers, right? And your right fingers, you can picture them, your left fingers. And if you can't picture your shoulder, your elbow, maybe you, maybe in your mind's eye, you can see your, your shoulder and you can see your elbow. And then after your elbow, there's just nothing, it's just gone. Start developing your mind's eye, your picture of imagination of what that hand's like. Maybe even with your left hand, close your eyes, and touch it, right? And connect your brain with the fact that it's there. It's there, it's there, right? We can do the same thing, it's there. And just work on work on connecting the two. And I'm not making this stuff up. This is stuff that we use on stroke patients years and years ago. Okay, thank you. So uh, 
I have here some questions uh, from Karen and from Ka uh, from Carlos. So uh, Karen asks, how long did you lose your voice? And Carlos asked, what was your lowest uh, FVC? My lowest of uh, uh, force vital capacity is 25. Um, I, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's actually an interesting caveat for a second. Um, uh, Marcel, don't let me forget the question, okay? If I go off on a tangent for a sec, please. Um, I, uh, I was singing with my quartet and I knew, I, knew that, uh, I knew that I had ALS and I knew that I was having some trouble breathing because I had to sleep sitting up, but I was on stage singing with my barbershop quartet. And as I was singing, uh, my, I lost my hearing, I couldn't hear, and the room started to close in and everything went dark. And luckily I had on Canadian crutches. They were kind of posted out, you know, and uh, apparently I hit a note, held it, and then passed out. <laughs> and one of my friends out in the audience saw my quartet kept singing, the other three kept singing, and uh, my friend ran up and grabbed me right before I actually fell off my crutches. Um, so at that point, my NIF was 19, and uh, I had to get on the AVAPs. And I lived on it for, for a while because I was just so, so exhausted. Um, so from then on, I had to actually, I had to work on balance, a darn word, I hate, I hate that, I love that word, I love that word, balance. Um, I had to work on how much I could do without tiring my diaphragm out because if I do too much, my numbers drop. And I finally got to the point where I kept my numbers, my, my, uh, uh, um, my FVC around 75 or so, but I took a trip to Florida to go help my mom with some stuff and the traveling and all that. I came back and I was in the thirties again. And so last week, last week I went and my, uh, my FVC was 47 up from 42 for about six months ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and that's great. So, and, mm -hmm. and you can get that. You, you can guarantee that after this hour is over, I'm going to go get on my AVAPs because I'm getting a little lightheaded as we speak. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah. Oh, was okay. that the question? No, that, that, no. The other question were there were some. There were two questions about your voice. So, how long did you lose your voice? And also, did you do something in particular to well, actually, to restore your voice? So I, I, I lost my voice to the point where I couldn't be heard unless someone came up and, and put their ear by me. Um, and I was having difficulty forming words. I, I never got to the point where I had sort of that ALS speak where I sounded kind of, kind of drunk. You guys don't know what I'm talking about. Right? Um, I, I, never, I never got to the point where I couldn't with over articulation uh, say my words. Um, but uh, I wore the Chatterbox for So three and a half, four years. And um, I would say that at the end of that is when my diaphragm started getting a little stronger and my voice started, <clears throat> started getting a little bit bigger. Um, and so, yes, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I see a lot of ALS people that are much worse off than I ever got, but that was a, that was a low point for me for sure. Okay. Um, we have a question from Veronique. Um, she asked if you had, were ever on medication, Reluzol or Radikiva. Yes, um, I did uh, Reluzol for a couple of months. Um, didn't like the way I felt on it, and my liver enzymes changed a bit, so I stopped. Didn't really see any results with the Reluzol. Um, mm -hmm. And Radikiva, about hmm, uh, six months ago, I did two months worth of Radikiva. And um, I, I, I got back a tiny bit of function in uh, being able to lift my right leg, you know, to like sit cross-legged uh, and also uh, use my vent a little bit less and maintained that and uh, only did two months worth. So I don't know, I'm gonna go back to, I don't know if it was just, cause it was in the first week that I started the medication. I don't know if it was just placebo, positive thinking, mm -hmm. or, or what, or if it was actually the medication, but that, those were the gains that I got, and I didn't get any more gains after that. So I'm not going to speak poorly of it. I don't think I'm going to do it again, because 
uh, especially with COVID, it's not worth it for me to go to the hospital every day and it wore me out going to the hospital every day to get the infusions. I just got too tired. Um, so I, I think everybody has to make that decision for themselves. I honestly think that uh, I got two thoughts. I got a lot of thoughts. I got two thoughts. Thank you to my doctors for making that available. Keep working on it. I don't think it's worth it to me to risk for just a couple of months more of life. At my in my point, I think I can do that with my mind at this point. But everybody's got to make their own decision. I don't. Okay. I think. I think Tish might have a separate, different opinion, but that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got a question from Maggie and Bruce. So they want to know if you can imagine uh, your diaphragm and breathing healing. So uh, the, the way you explain from your uh, from your arms and hands, totally. would you also do such thing for a diaphragm and breathing? Absolutely, absolutely. So your diaphragm is a muscle and um, it, and it's it's in a dome shape like this. And every time you breathe, it flattens out and it squishes all your guts to the side and it tips your sacrum back and it pulls your pulls your head back and it's it's an amazing muscle it's the only muscle okay so oh I, I wish i could play with you guys i wish you, all your mics were on it's the only muscle that you can both actively uh, voluntarily and involuntarily use right you can hold your breath and stop mm. it from moving and then it just keeps doing its thing on its own anyway so it's an amazing it's it's one of the most amazing muscles in the body as well as your tongue for those of you that have trouble with uh with chewing swallowing and talking What's the only muscle in your body that has an origin, but nothing to it that doesn't attach to anything? Right? How does it do that? What a crazy muscle. Just imagine the power that that muscle has and how you can connect with it. It's just, it's one of the smartest muscles in the body, along with the diaphragm. I mean, the diaphragm mm -hmm. has more innervation to it, more, more control, control from two different systems. You know, you've got uh, autonomic, and, I mean, I won't get into all the neurology, but it's just, yeah, it's an amazing muscle. I can totally visualize my diaphragm getting better. And I am going to, next time I go to my pulmonologist, my numbers will be higher. I okay. guarantee. I guarantee. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, can question I, for myself one second? Not everybody's like me, but I have body parts laying around. And it is kind of funny that it's Halloween, but it's not just Halloween in my house. I actually have things like this for when. I'm feeling like my arm's getting a little weak and I'm having trouble cutting my food. Um, I pull these out and I sleep with them, you know, so that I can actually connect with my parts and, and you know, visualize them getting better. Okay. We have a question from Paul. So it says, sometimes I feel I shouldn't be really positive and I should be more realistic, almost a bit of denial about that he could heal. Mm -hmm. Did you also, experience that sometimes or is it yeah. have you always been positive no no paul no uh you know um uh when i was first diagnosed um i was pr uh, practicing chiropractic and i had a patient a husband and wife actually who were psychiatrists and i was in i was in one of those moods and we were having some pretty deep conversations during the treatment and i said can i ask you a, a like a personal question i know it's kind of overlapping with business a little bit but i i, I told her i said I feel like I feel like I'm just in denial and I just I want to stay in denial. And that's that that's just for me. That's all I can do right now. And she asked me a few questions about what kind of things that I was doing about ALI. So I said, well, you know, we changed our diet, we did this, we did that. And, and uh, she said, that's a pretty impressive list of things that you're trying. And, and I said, yeah, but the, the denial is just a great place. And she said, do you know what do you know what hope is? Hope is. Hope is one part denial and two parts effort, right? So mm -hmm. denial is okay. Denial is all right because sometimes you just, you just, it's sometimes it's just hard to, to really face all this stuff, but you just got to keep putting one foot in front of the other and just keep moving and keep doing the right thing. And denial becomes something more positive, you know? And it's also one of the stages of grieving. So look at those stages of grieving and see whether or not, you know, what, when the next one's coming, you know, you know what I mean? The next stage, because it's okay to be in denial. I mean, it's actually, it's identified from the medical profession as one of the places you should be when bad things happen. You live in denial for a while because that's how all you can do. 
and then you move mm-hmm. to the next step slowly and then maybe mm-hmm. the next step and you get into the fourth stage of denial you know and you're down maybe in um i don't know bargaining or something right and you're you're bargaining on one thing and then something else happens to you and now you're having another health challenge and you go back and you start and you're in denial again on that one while you're down in bargaining on the other one and you just work through stages you know it's just part of the the way your brain works it's an mm-hmm. emotional process so don't be okay. don't worry about it don't doubt yourself so just keep putting one foot in front of the other yeah okay. and i think accepting the diagnosis but not the prognosis i mean your doctor mm-hmm. does is not god he doesn't have a crystal ball to say this is what's going to happen to you you have a lot of control about what's going to happen to you. So it doesn't mean you're in denial of, hey, this is my situation right now. But certainly you've got, you you can't have a lot of control over your future. I think that hope, what Kathy said, you know, it, it totally changes your mindset. Wow, there's hope. And even when you're going downhill, it doesn't mean you can't go uphill later. It just means it takes time. You may have takes time to get those toxins down to get the to get the uh, supplements your your deficiencies corrected. It takes time, so let your body give your body the time it takes to heal. It doesn't mean you're in denial. It just means you 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 you're in denial about what what they're telling you. But people that happens to people all the time. Hey, a doctor said you're going to be dead in two years. Well, doc, I'm not dead and I'm still walking. <laughs> Yeah, what happened? Yeah. Well, the doctor shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> well, I think I think um, denial is not a bad thing. Denial is a process, and you can be in denial and still be optimistic, and be and be progressing in the right direction at the same time. So don't think that you can only do one thing at a time. You can only be in denial, or you can only be positive, because you can do both. Right? Okay. There, you can. Yeah. We have uh, w- one more question here, and then I would propose, indeed, as Scott said, to to unmute people who want to to just have a question that they were not able to type it in. So uh, the final question here is from Linda: Did you use a feeding tube at any time? I did not. I did not. Okay. I did not have a feeding tube. No. David Murray has a question. Hi, David. That was such an an inspirational presentation. Thank you so much. No, my for that. Uh, can I just ask, was there any specific supplement that really helped you through this process? No, I mean, I, I took uh, hundreds, hundreds. I mean, I, at one point I had this big box that was, you know, 20 pills breakfast, 20 pills lunch, you know, dinner, bedtime. Um, and, uh, but I, this is one of the more challenging things uh, for me, both as a patient and as a doctor, if I uh, if I were taking something that was particularly uh, helpful for me, the effects take time. So I wouldn't really know, you know. And I chose in my in my path to throw the to throw the book at it, literally to just do everything whenever it felt right. And I rotated my I rotated my treatment plan around and and came back to stuff that felt really good and just tossed out stuff that I didn't like and uh, have a very smart partner who basically said, if you really, really hate the idea, then you have to do it because anything that I was totally resistant to, they obviously had to do. So um, yeah, so uh, I have some around, I'm surrounded by a lot of wisdom, but I can't tell you there was any one supplement that when I took it, I felt great, except for, and this is me in particular, DMSA. Um, when I took the MSA, I felt like a little superhero, and uh, that was part of the detox regime that I was doing when I was doing uh, chelation and DNPS de- chelations, oh, yeah. banana bags, and that kind of stuff. But I loved it when I got to be on the cycle where I was taking the MSA for for a few days because I just felt strong and alive and vital, and I felt really great, and it gave me a little flash of where I could go, you know, from here. Um, but um, uh, other than that, there was no one particular supplement, but I do think there are lots of good supplements. I just, there wasn't one that stood out that said, I swallow this when I feel great. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. 
And thank you so much. It's the most marvellous. You've made such a great end to our day here over in the UK. So we're really appreciative. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, Rob Lawson, are you on? Because I couldn't I, find I am. Yes, yeah, yes. I, I, yeah, I, I, yes, I would love, I would love you to call me, please, or, or, or text. I me. don't have your number, so I shared. Uh, just text me. Yeah, that. Oh, great, because I couldn't find. Chat. I sent a private chat to you on that. Oh, okay, I lost. I'll, I, I'll look for I it. I would write your number down, but I can't write. That's fine. Great, <laughs> perfect. Um, yeah. and uh, oh, uh, Quan, was that you? That yeah. wasn't what I was going to say, though. Oh yeah, you raised your hand. Go ahead. There's actually an official hand raise thing you can I'll do. With it. That's good. good. You know, I'll, I'll but, wait till till my turn. Okay, good. Because uh, we're going to do a corn, and then after corn, uh, Catherine uh, Welker, and then uh, Rob. After that, how's that? Thanks, Tish. Um, uh, Kathy, you're totally Hi. inspiring. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I saw you at the convention, and wow, just just amazing. Um, you did a lot of detox. And in my husband does ozone therapy, um, IV ozone therapy, and I know it breaks free radicals out. Um, he can't do the IV glutathione while he's doing the IV ozone, mm. right? Because it breaks loose the, the, the um, mercury and delivers it to the brain. So do you know if you did anything to stop the free radical flow when you were doing your detox? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I need to qualify. I haven't done ozone therapy. Right, I understand. Um, okay. But when I was doing my detox plan, um, I had an amazing, amazing uh, MD, functional ND, uh, doctor of oriental medicine. Um, and he, he was the smartest man I ever knew. He was battling cancer while I was battling ALS. And he was walking the walk. You know what I mean? Every, I would have, I would have, thrown such a fit with any doctor that just said, take all these vitamins, do all these things. You got to do colonics. You got to blah, blah, blah. If he wasn't doing it himself, which really aggravated me because he was doing it himself too. So I couldn't complain. Um, but uh, so when I was doing uh, uh, chelation and detox, I was also doing peat baths with uh, some kind of Czechoslovakian mud that pulled the, the toxins out of the skin. I was also doing castor oil packs, which helped the detox. I have a far infrared sauna that I use. Okay. I was doing uh, colonics, uh, you know, actually go to a, a, a colonic specialist and she's got this big thing that looks like a space capsule and you climb in there and do things you don't want to talk about. Um, okay. And uh, I was taking, oh boy, about six or seven different supplements that were supposed to help clear things out, including um, some psyllium and some other things that were kind of fiber to make sure that everything was moving through at a, at a good pace. So, uh, and at the same time, making sure that my gut stayed healthy. So there were at least four, in my mind, kind of aggressive things that were addressing uh, my skin because it's the biggest organ, you know, and getting it all out in my gut and getting it all out. Um, and uh, boy, what else? The detox for me was the, I went through, I think eight or nine cycles of detox at the beginning years. And then as I had some dental work done, I did the detox process again, pre and post dental work. And then again with Gomer, um, we had some different stuff that we wanted to detox. So we did it again. So um, it's been different um, but the basic idea is use your skin as an organ, use your gut as an organ and, and detox through that. So that's so ca castor oil, castor oil packs, castor oil packs, peat baths, um, e -E. red sauna e -E. and hydrocolon, um, uh, um, uh, colonics, uh, hydrotherapy. And it's P-E-E-T. I've never heard of those. P -E -E yeah. It came, it came in a big hot dog roll. And you'd break off a chunk and put it in the bath with you. And it was like, it was taking a bath in mud. Um, okay. Yeah. But, and I, again, that was years ago. There might be more efficient things now. Uh, you know, um, I didn't really prepare uh, for this talk what the most current detox things are. So I don't think I'm a great expert on that right now. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. you're welcome. Sure. I really, I really appreciate that. No, okay. My... Catherine Keller and then Rob. What I was going to ask her, I know last week there was a, a lot of talk about detox. I'm getting a lot of, I'm the caregiver for my husband. 
and I'm getting a lot of pressure for detox program. I'm, I'm in natural health personally. So I'm looking at things and all I see is that there's a really right way to do it supposedly. And so my question is, because there's so much out there, what would you say is a good place to start on detoxing um, for somebody? Um, I know my husband, my husband's been, he was a big golfer and he's been out on golf courses. I sit here and I think mm, all those chemicals, I do a lot in my own home have and teach my clients how to, to take a lot of toxins out of our environment, but how do I detox him? What is, what would, what might be the best? And I'm overwhelmed right now. So I just want to have somebody feed me for a moment and tell me how to uh, do things. Oh, Catherine, oh, love you, and and thank you for all that you do as a caregiver. Um, thank you. Yeah, and all of us are telling you how much we love you. Um, so uh, there is no absolute right answer. So your confusion is uh, actually normal, I think, because I don't think that without doing a good full history and knowing everything about what your husband, where your husband is, and what he's been going through, there's an easy way for me to answer that question. So with that caveat. What I would say is that if his gut is healthy enough to push the toxins through, then you, you could be safe in starting a detox. And if there's a way for him to communicate with you when he doesn't feel well, as far as being too toxified, you know, like I feel foolish kind of thing um, or something like that, so that you know when to stop or when too much has been done. The, the important thing with the detox is, I think detox is amazing as long as you have the second half of that, which is the clarifying, right? I is mean, what? Is clarifying. You can, you can free all this crap up in your system. And then from the inside out, you, I mean, you're just toxified, right? So you've got to find a way to get that stuff that you've freed up out and clear it from your system. So um, this sounds like a really silly example. Um, I know for me that I have passed my window when I go into Home Depot and I walk down the pesticide aisle and my, my lips and my tongue start to, to tingle. I know that's silly, right? Whose doctor's no. ever asked me that question? Probably never. But I know that I am right on that crashing edge of toxicity and I'm too ill to actually start detoxing. And what I need to do is start building my system up for a little while first, because if I were to just go in and detox, if I were to go to my, my ND and and uh, not listen to my MD's advice and say, my lips were numb when I went in the pesticide aisle, put me on a, a detox, a chelation, you know, IV detox, DNPS thing right now, because I said so. And he did that, I would probably crash and burn because I would just be so overloaded with toxins. So instead, my NDs are smart enough or my functional med docs are smart enough to say, let's get your gut healthier first. Let's get you on some banana bags and vitamin Bs. Let's get your, you know, all your vitamins up. Let's get your health better. Let's get your gut working better. Let's get you processing everything better. And that's going to take a week, two, a month, two, and then we'll get you detoxing and you'll be able to handle it, right? Because you don't want to, the only dangerous thing that I can think of in what we've talked about is detoxing too fast without the ability right. to throw it out. Yeah. And so yeah. you're absolutely, absolutely right in being confused because there's no clear answer. And, um, it really has to be sort of an intuitive thing about what I feel I can handle, what my body says I can handle, you know, how my gut's functioning, how, you know, how well my skin detoxifies, right? I mean, my, I don't sweat very well and my dad didn't sweat. Oh. It's our thing. So I'm at a huge disadvantage when it comes to detoxifying through my skin. That's why I need the farm for red sauna and the peat baths and all that stuff. Okay. So, so I definitely... Go ahead. I was going to say, um, because of my fascination with natural health, um, we've done a lot of, I say we, I sneak all kinds of things into his diet, et cetera, <laughs> make uh, fermented foods, et cetera, to help build that gut, give him a little bit of colostrum. He's not really receptive to that. So I sneak it in here and there. Um, I'm really evil. <laughs> <laughs> he does the B12 shots, some other Bs. We, we do quite a bit of, of things along that line. So I do some clay salt foot masks that I've done with my clients for him to help pull that. So um, 
maybe I need to do some of that a little more frequently, but not too much. Um, and yes, and there's also safe ways, Catherine. If you if you okay. rewatch the detox again, the recording, um, like okay. for example, the the DMSA, the 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 chelators that are pulling out, but you're not getting them out of your body. That's when you feel terrible, and no matter what your doctor says, you have to stop because if you're having reactions, so that's really important. But the, the saunas in general, and there's another question in the chat about the saunas, they're laying down saunas, they're sitting up saunas. That's a little, that's, that can be a lot safer way to detox okay. because you don't, okay. it, you do have to make sure you replace your electrolytes and your minerals. But in general, that's a, that is a much, in my opinion, much safer way. I don't know whether you agree with that or not, uh, Kathy. Um, you know, I, I spoke to one medical doctor and she had done six months of chelation and nothing, she couldn't touch her mercury. And yet six months of an hour a day in the sauna um, completely got rid of it and it totally took away her symptoms. So it just, everybody's different and you've got to do okay. what you have the strength to do, what your husband has the strength to do. And you can okay. tell when it's too much, you got to stop. I've talked to people who've done, you know, they'll do 30 minutes a day because they can't do an hour. It's too much for them. You know, even 20 minutes is enough. So everybody's different and you've got to listen to that. You have to listen to your body and your husband has to listen to your body. First of all, thank you very much. Very, as always, uh, very inspiring, uh, very practical, uh, fantastic. I really enjoy and look forward to these. Uh, I know this is about, you know, the mind body connection. Uh, do you have any diet that you uh, believe in that helped you? Uh, well, or philosophy, a philosophy, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I believe in resonance for one, I believe that my body knows what it what feels good in it, right? And so my diet changes. Um, I do believe there are some absolutes. I know that we're being poisoned by an awful lot of pesticides and uh, glyphosate and stuff. So the dirty dozen and the clean 12, or the clean 15, dirty dozen, clean 15, absolutely start there. I mean, I know with ALS, finances are almost always a challenge for most of us. So uh, if you have to pick organics, definitely only eat organics of the, the dirty dozen because that'll protect you. When it comes to things like wheat, you know, um, if you get off wheat, great. If not, then you need to watch, watch to make sure because you're almost guaranteed that if the wheat's not organic, that there are uh, pesticides in that. Um, so, you know, there's some absolutes, I would say. Uh, and in that absolute, which I should say that there are never an absolute, which I'm not sure if that makes sense, double negatives, but um, uh, you also have to just give yourself a break once in a while. And if there's something special, you know, treat yourself. So you don't feel deprived because I think that's really important because this is a, a long-term lifestyle change. So I think I think uh, eating a healthy diet that is not polluted with things that destroy our central nervous system is super important for one. And then replenishing with uh, fruits and vegetables, healthy, healthy proteins for me are huge. And I'm not sure if that's part of everybody's ALS picture or not, but I know I get very depleted when I don't have enough protein. And for me, protein means, you know, good salmon. Um, and I'm, luckily I'm in a place where I've got a huge freezer full of salmon straight off the boat. Um, and so that's, that's fantastic for me. Um, uh, so no, I don't subscribe to any one person's diet, but when I read like all of the diets of the ALS pals, they all have gems in them. I just had to go through and sort through it and decide what was best for me. But everybody knows fruits and vegetables, organics, non-GMOs, you know, uh, healthy proteins, um, good three omega-3s for your fats. Get everything synergistically from your diet. So hopefully you don't have to supplement a whole lot. But I think we all pretty much need to supplement with like vitamin Ds and certain things that just we aren't getting naturally in our foods. So there's a list of some vitamins that our foods just can't carry anymore because of the way they, they're transported and, and harvested. Thank you. Sure, Rob. And we can talk about it. You, I think you've got my information. We can talk about that more. Yeah, too. and I think you've got, you, you talk quite a bit about diet in your, um, in your presentation on the conference. Is that right? I can't remember, but maybe. <laughs> okay, so there's a, there's a lot about diet there as well as in the conference recordings. So, um, uh, Scott, you were about to uh, talk and you were on mute before. 
I was just saying, we're going to come to a hard stop uh, at the top of the hour. And so um, let's just keep the questions fairly, you know, rapid going and the answer's not too long. Got the hint. Got it. Got it. Okay, good. Uh, Smita, did you have a, your hand is raised. I'm going to lower your hand too. I, I just wanted to know what is the one thing if I have to ask you what is one thing which has really started you feel improvement rest if Scott only gives me one word answers rest learning how rest. to balance and and um, understand my body's limits so I got more rest I I think that part of my ALS was that I was I was exhausted I was I was so worn out um from just my life choices being so busy that my body just could no longer maintain the, the speed that i was at so i sleep now 10 11 hours a night um and good quality sleep i i in my conference those of you that uh, that saw my conference recording i i honestly think that life boils down to one question and it has two pieces how'd you sleep how'd you poop that's all poop is very important. <laughs> I just sleep, I just poop. If you don't sleep well and you don't poop well, you're probably not going to benefit from anything you put in and nothing's going to come out right. Is there anything you uh, which helps with sleeping? Meditation helps me a lot with sleeping. I think meditation, as far as a natural approach, works very well. Um, melatonin helps me sleep. There's some nice uh, natural cocktails, you know, Passiflora hops, uh, melatonin, valerian, if you can get past the bad stink, stinky feet smell. Um, you know, there's a lot of really nice natural cocktails. And then I uh, don't, 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 tell, well, don't tell anybody, but I also have, you know, a little pharmaceutical thing here too. So I, I'm not opposed to, you know, if I haven't slept well for a couple of days and I know I'm gonna take a bad turn, to also use a little bit of, of something that's sedated from Benadryl or something like that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Scott, you want to start the goodbyes? <laughs> yes. Well, we enjoyed everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I'm going to start saying goodbye to everybody. I know I can't get to everybody, but bye, Chad. Bye, Brian and Maria. Bye, Dorothea. Bye, Shmita. Bye, Rob. Bye, David. Bye, Lucy and Linda and Tony and Susan and Lisa. Bye, Maggie. Bye, Lynette. We'll see you there. Bye, Lynette. Bye-bye, Jane. Bye, David. Bye, Lori. Bye-bye, Mary. Bye, Alan and Bob. Bye-bye, Paul. Nice to see you there. And Dory and, and James. Bye. We'll see you, Michelle. Michelle, friends and fell there. And Daddy and Lorraine, nice to see you again, Lorraine. Bye-bye. Bye, Jimmy and John and Samuel and Freddie and Brian. Thank you for being here, Carlos and Dondalea and Hillary. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye, everyone. Thank you one more time to Kathy Cummins. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Kathy. Thank you. Kathy. Thank you. Kathy. That was wonderful. Bye-bye, everybody.